we put our money into healing and the food and the shelter and creating a better life for all people on the planet. There are people over Why in the protest camp area that are protesting the wars. Why don't we sit in the negotiation table to solve our problems rather than dropping bombs on Meanwhile, people? Meanwhile, over in the corner back over there, there are people getting arrested. Could you answer that question, please? Over there. Why? My, my friend Norman Morrison burned himself to death outside the Pentagon here, appealing to the United States to stop the insanity of the the war in Vietnam. If he, if the people in the Pentagon had listened, if Secretary of McNamara had listened, more than two million Vietnamese would not be dead. More than 50,000 American soldiers would not be dead. The more than 50,000 Vietnamese veterans who have committed suicide since the war would not be dead. Cheer, cheer for the arrestees. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who are speaking for truth and for love. Can you explain what's happening? Our friends who have attempted to deliver a letter to, to Secretary Carter asking that we stop the insanity of war instead of being allowed to deliver that letter are being arrested and taken off to jail. They are, they are acting under our First Amendment privilege to freedom of speech. Petition the government for redress of grievance. Why are they being arrested? Shouldn't we be arresting the people inside the Pentagon that are involved in helping support these wars and organize the wars? And lie yes. About them. And lie about them. We appeal to all of you inside the Pentagon to search your own heart and your own conscience. Can you continue? A work that, yes, is giving you pay, but children in other countries are dying as a result of what you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you for going to jail for justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The wrong people are being arrested. A society is broken when it arrests the right people and lets the wrong people continue work of murder and destruction inside an enormous office building as if it's routine and normal and acceptable. It isn't. David's friend who burned himself to death here is beloved by the people of Vietnam. The people who work inside this building, paid for by us with trillions of dollars, are despised and hated around the world, as we would despise and hate people who bombed us and kicked in our doors and stationed troops in our lands. Stop it. It's counterproductive. Every time somebody retires from this building, they admit it. They step out and say, we're creating more enemies than we're killing. It's not working. It's counterproductive. But I couldn't say it a week ago because I worked there. Why can't you say it when you work here? Why does it have to be people outside in a free speech cage to say it? Why can't we talk to you and you talk to us? That's what the First Amendment was for. Not for shouting in a cage for petitioning the government for a redress of grievances. And my God, we got some grievances. The world's got grievances. We have seven countries being bombed from this building. These aren't desk jobs. These aren't peaceful jobs. These are people telling other people to kill unknown countless numbers of men women and children and it's mostly children and the elderly 
It's mostly civilians by your own definitions. These are slaughters. These are one-sided slaughters. It's not heroism. It's not noble. It's not cool because you wear camouflage in front of a marble building. It's stupid. It's dumb. It's backward. It's the only thing from St. Augustine and other ancient saints people were talking about earlier that we still hang on to. We tried to outgrow slavery. We tried to outgrow sexism. We tried to outgrow slaughtering Jews and heretics. Why do we hang on to the idea of war? It doesn't belong. It doesn't fit. The people don't want it. Don't believe me, have a vote. Call that democracy instead of calling this democracy. It ain't. You can't call it freedom when we have fewer freedoms after every goddamn war for freedom. We weren't in cages for our freedom before all the wars for freedom. We were outside having our freedom freely. Remember that? Barely. <laughs> We've had enough. You can get other jobs. Did you know that you get more jobs with the same dollars put into peaceful industries? Did you know that even tax cuts for working people is more jobs? We're not trying to cost anybody their job. We want to find you a job where you can sleep at night and we can be friends and talk to each other without fences and walls and handcuffs. We're not against the people who work here. We want you to stop working here. We want you to come outside and breathe some air while there's still air to breathe. Come on, join us. Former Secretary of Defense McNamara pointed out that 180 million people died in wars in the 20th century. And he said, after all his years here conducting all these wars, he said, certainly there has to be a better way. But we haven't taken his advice and found a better ways yet. And the Pentagon doesn't seem to be offering any better way of solving problems than fighting more wars. Since our friends were not allowed to deliver the letter to Secretary Carter, we invite him to come out to talk with us. We'd like to have a friendly discussion about how do we really how do we really find security? It's not through killing more people. Secretary Carter, we hope you'll come out to join us. Uh, I'll just mention this briefly, but I have, a, I have a commercial. I hope you folks don't mind the public service announcement. But uh, Norman Morrison, uh, was from Baltimore. He was the peace secretary at Stony Run Friends in Baltimore. And I would argue that he did have an effect on McNamara. He did not have the effect uh, immediately, but many, many years later, if you read Fog of War, you've seen the film, uh, it, he had a major effect on uh, Robert McNamara. But what I wanted to urge everyone, if you're here in, in the Washington, D.C. area, if you get a chance, get over to the East Street Cinema because they're showing Command and Control. It's a brilliant, brilliant film. And it's a, a book that Eric Schlosser did about the madness of nuclear weapons. And one of the things you'll see in this movie is a Titan missile, eight stories high with a nuclear warhead on top. And remember, that Triton missile never never killed anybody overseas, never got the Russians or anyone, but it did kill people in the United States. You'll see this in the film. Another thing to note in this film, after this accident happened, 1980, September, in Damascus, Arkansas, there was a potential for a nuclear explosion, but the Air Force kept everything totally secret. Remember, Bill Clinton was the president, at, I mean, the governor at the time, he did not know. Walter Mondale was in town because this was the uh, presidential election. He did not know. The Air Force refused to tell anyone, including the local sheriff. 
He did not know that there could be a massive explosion, nuclear explosion, that would go who knows how many miles with the fallout. It's at the E Street Cinema. Don't miss it. It's a brilliant, brilliant movie. I happen to see it with the director, with Eric Slosher and Dan Zach, who wrote the great book Almighty about the Transform Now Plowshares. They were there to talk about this film. You, you should not miss it. It's it just reinforces over and over again the madness of nuclear weapons. They serve no purpose, no purpose at all. The money that is wasted, anybody is concerned, I'll take you for a walk through Baltimore. And I'll just mention this because I mentioned Phil Berrigan earlier. When he died, we marched from the Jonah House. Joe Byrne here holding the sign with me is from uh, Baltimore's Jonah House. We marched over to St. Peter Claver Church, where Phil was was uh, was uh, a member of, the, of of that particular church. And at that time, we could get national media to cover things like that. And they were astonished to see what they saw in Baltimore. And nothing has changed. If nothing else, it got worse. St. Peter Claver is not far from where Freddie Gray was killed. My friend Bruce Gagnon is here with with us today. And I took Bruce over to the Joan House a number of years ago. And this is what Bruce said, and he's welcome to rebut or add to it. He said he's never seen the devastation of a city like Baltimore. The only other city that compared to it was Detroit. So we gotta just keep on going. But if you want to see a brilliant, and this is a very, very good film about the madness of nuclear weapons, it doesn't detail like the book all of the nuclear mishaps but there are thousands, and once again, we live in a surveillance state, but the Air Force was refusing to tell anyone. In other words, the Air Force was in charge. You couldn't get a governor, you couldn't get a vice president to get information, and this continues today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Oh. I did say that. Well, Bruce confirmed it, he, he did admits say it. it. He admits it. So I just want to take a moment to recognize that as we are out here today the u.s military is assisting the saudi government in the daily bombings in yemen and these people here in this building are directly connected to the killing of civilians in one of the poorest countries in the arab world and turning these beautiful ancient buildings into rubble killing men, women, and children, unarmed civilians. And supposedly the U.S. government is also providing not only the airplanes, the munitions, the weapons, but the logistical and quote intelligence support. So let's take a moment to think about what that intelligence support is. Because just last week, there came out a report that looked at every one of the 8,633 airstrikes that have been conducted since March of 2015. And they said that a third of those strikes were civilian targets. So here we have these brilliant minds inside that are giving logistical support to kill people in schools, in clinics, in hospitals, five hospitals run by Doctors Without Borders, neighborhoods, weddings, funerals, and every day this bombing is going on. And here we go about our lives, and these people go to work as if they're doing something positive for this nation and for the world. And in the meantime, the killing goes on every single day, supplying weapons to one of the most repressive countries in the world, Saudi Arabia, calling them our friends, making the military industrial complex wealthier and wealthier. If you go ride around in the suburbs in Virginia, you'll see mansion after mansion after mansion. And I can guarantee that most of those mansions are people who do contracting for the Pentagon. The people who work for the Pentagon, the high up people, they go to work for these military, quote, industries afterwards and break in lots and lots of money. And so this area is considered one of the wealthiest areas in the country. And that's because of the military industrial complex. 
that sold $110 billion worth of weapons to the Saudis just under the Obama administration, under the nice Democrat that opened up the beautiful African American Museum this weekend. And meanwhile, killing people of color thousands of miles away who are doing nothing to harm us. And in the, process, in the, in the meantime, actually strengthening Al-Qaeda in Yemen, bringing in a new group, ISIS, into Yemen that didn't exist before. So here we are bombing innocent people, getting involved in a civil war that we have no business being involved in, and then opening up the space for other terrorist groups to come in. So let's just take a moment to recognize what we are doing to the people of Yemen right now to recognize all the death and the destruction and the hatred we are sowing. In many of these cultures, there is an honor to taking revenge for the lives that were taken of your family. I've been to Yemen. I've met people whose families were killed by the US government. They say this will go on for generations now, the hatred towards the United States. We create enemies. We go out and seek enemies. We need enemies to keep this war machine going, to keep these jobs going, to keep these happy people getting off the metro and the buses and parking their cars and smiling and going into work and getting paid pretty well. And as far as I know, have better pensions and salaries than most of the working people in this country. We can't let it keep happening. Our lives are getting worse. Our city's being destroyed. The black community in this country rising up to say what the hell is going on. The disinvestment in our schools, the lack of jobs for our young people and then the police come in to kill us like we're subhuman. They're rising up in the cities. We're joining hands to rise up in the cities. And we've got to rise up here as well because it's all so connected. The guns on our streets, the militarized police, and the endless, voracious nature of this war machine we're standing in front of. So I bow down to everyone here today to thank you for being here, to thank you for being the conscience and the soul of this nation for many, many years. And as we listen to the debates tonight, I doubt we're gonna hear what we need to hear. I doubt we're gonna hear either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump say that our nation has been at war way too long that after 15 years, not counting the decades and decades and decades of war and the war that our nation was founded on, that the people are tired of war. And that if we really want a healthcare system that's good for our people, if we really want to give young people the education they deserve and not make them indentured servants when they leave college, the only way we can do it is if we break up this war machine Time to break up this war machine. Thank you. Hand around a little bit. It's still out of your pocket as you were leaving. To go over there.